Okay, so so we are starting the last session now. We'll have two talks. First one is prof by Professor Anurag Purwar from Stony Brook University. So he has done work for a long time on mechanism synthesis, and now he is one of the pioneers in using AI and mechanism synthesis. <laughs> so I think he'll tell more about that. Thank you. All right, so uh, I, I have spent my time with uh, Professor Jim Schmidtler. Uh, I don't see him yet, but if he doesn't show up, we'll bring the Anjan back here to have him finish his presentation. But before I get started with my presentation, I want to show you guys something really fun. So yesterday, if you were here in the first session by, by Professor McCarthy, uh, you saw the motion gen app, and you saw his, saw his GeoGebra uh, work. But I want to show you our uh, logo that uh, uh, Professor McCarthy's daughter, Sarah, she designed this. Uh, so it's a beautiful logo. And we talked a little bit about which one should we pick because she designed several of those. And, and we noticed there was a four bar in there. So, so I'm going to show you what that four bar really does, OK, over here, real quick. Okay, so uh, let's see. I'm going to draw right on top of it. And here's my crank and rocker. I'm going to bring it over here. No, that's not what I meant to do. So like this. Okay. All right, let me, let me uh, reduce the capacity a little bit so you can see this better. And I'll actually play it also for you. So, so, so our summer school is called Kinetic Summer School. In short, we call it KISS. And what does that look like? You guys don't eat chocolate? <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> those are Hershey's Kisses. Yeah. And there are two of those. And I think if we played a little bit with the end of the position, we might have both of those circuits come closer to each other. <laughs> All right, OK. Now we can go back to the presentation. Uh, that was just to draw your attention. Okay. All right. so. Um, Starting this morning, we have laid a pretty good foundation for what I'm about to present to you, okay? In the morning, Professor Javier talked about the fundamentals uh, of Quartanian, the Clifford algebra, and he also touched upon uh, this new framework that both him and I are developing <coughs> together as part of an NSF project. So I'll have a little bit more to talk about that, but at least he covered the fundamentals, and then Professor Chakravarti gave an excellent talk on uh, machine learning fundamentals, so I can assume that you all now remember everything that you've learned since morning. Um, so machine learning, you know, it's just a tool, right, for us, for engineers. Uh, and of course, I don't know everything about machine learning. In fact, uh, probably the person who knows more is, is my PhD student, Srinath, who's sitting back there. So if you guys have any detailed questions, like how many layers of network we are using, He's the guy to speak to, okay? He's the one who put together that app that we were playing with in the previous session. Uh, and that was just like a few days of work that we did very, very quickly. So, good work. So, I think in, in this session, I'm actually going to raise more questions than actually give you the answers. Okay? So, you'll probably go home thinking about several things that you could actually do with the machine learning. Uh, and that's a good thing, right? As engineers, we rather we rather ask questions. Because we know that if we ask the right question, we can always find the answers if we spend enough time solving the problem. Okay? Uh, so we are focused on with the kinematic synthesis, not all kinds of uh, uh, machine design over here, not about the dynamics and all that. So, and we're going to see what machine learning can do for us, right? So we know that machine learning can help us solve problems. And even the solutions that we have well, if they're not acceptable, maybe machine learning can help you with that, okay? What I've been a little bit more interested lately is in asking if we can ask new questions that we are not posed to. What do I mean by that? So if you look at the kinematic synthesis research in the last four or five decades, starting with Fraud and Steenberg, uh, we have created these very nice classifications for the problems. So we know what path synthesis problem is, we know what motion synthesis problem is, we know what functional synthesis is, and these are like pretty really nice categorization that you'll find in every kinematics book out there. Uh, this is not on. Okay, so I'm going to turn this on. Okay, so this is a little bit louder. 
right? Uh, and Professor McCarthy has written a fantastic book on kinematic synthesis of geometric linkages and things like that. So, so that's on, on the problem side, right? Now, who created these classifications? I don't know. Perhaps these classifications were created so that we could solve the problems the way we could solve them. So we created certain algebraic equations, what we call synthesis equations or structural equations, and we could neatly pick a problem that belongs to one of these categories and use our algebraic equation to solve them. If you talk to the designers, industry practitioners, and I've worked with several of those, they will not be able to tell you that this is a motion generation problem or a path generation problem. They might say, you know, I have some basic idea of what I want my machine or mechanism to do, um, but it definitely does not belong to one of those three categories. Apart from that, there might be a lot of other constraints, like Professor Agrawal was asking in, in Professor Shanwar Kong's session, you know, I have a given motion, but I have all constraints. These are the attachment points around the human body, and I can't have my, you know, manipulator's fixed pivot located on the ceiling because then it would not be practical to have something like that. So if you talk to the actual designers like him, like him uh, they will tell you that it's, it's not just motion. There are all kinds of other constraints that come with the problem. So clearly, it's, it's not working if we just have these neat classifications. Okay, so that's on, on the problem side. Now, even if you focus on one particular area, one particular classification of the problem, like let's say motion generation, how do we specify a motion generation problem? We give you like a certain number of poses. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And you know, if you give me five positions, it's very well known the classic Burmester problem, I can design a four-bar linkage. If one exists, then I can design a four-bar linkage that will go to the five position. But it's not always true that you'll get a four-bar linkage that goes to the five position. Sometimes you don't get any solution. Now, who said that you can specify a motion generation problem by five positions? What if I give you 10 positions? What if I give you 20 positions? What if I give you three positions? They say, oh, we've got three positions. We have two infinity solutions. We have, four, we have one infinity solution. Now, how do you narrow down on the problem, right? On the solution side, we can solve these algebraic equations, but most of the time, they give you garbage, right? I'll give you a dub. So in the motion gen, which is our homegrown app, which implements some of the algorithms that we have developed over the years for synthesis. So get rid of this. Okay. I can input five positions. That's the four bar? Where's the four bar? I don't see it. Okay. So I'm going to roll the dice here, right? Because I don't want to keep inputting these. So I'm going to roll the dice, five arbitrary position. Let's see. Okay, I see a four bar. So this is being computed in real time using our algorithm. So there's no database here, right? Okay, so I've got, uh, looks like one, two, three positions on one circuit, uh, actually on one branch. This is a branch of crime proper, so it's two circuits. So, and then other two are on the other circuit. So I've got a circuit defect here now, right? Okay, let's roll the dice again. What do we have? Four bar, okay, again, that's the same problem, circuit defect problems, right? So this four bar is capable of going through all the five positions, but not in a practical sense. Right? We see the problem over here. So we get these defective mechanisms, circuit defect, the branch defect, the order defect, and all, all kinds of problems. And there are no good analytical and theoretical models to really solve these problems. Okay, what have people done? Well, they tried to tweak the position slightly, right? So in the vicinity of one of these positions, I can select this, and I can try to rotate and see what happens, right? Oh, now my mechanism is changing, right? But sometimes the mechanism could change completely arbitrarily. See, with only like a 10 degree or 15 degree change, the mechanism has changed completely. But do I have a solution where all the positions are on one circuit? Still not. Right? So it looks like because of this highly non relationship between the input, which is the position, and the output, which is the linkage system, uh, I can't get good solutions. But it's a double-edged sword, actually, if you think about it. What if the solution is just lurking in the vicinity of this particular orientation or position. If I can tweak that slightly, maybe I'll find a good solution. But where is that solution? We don't know that. So this is where we are hoping that machine learning can help us. Machine learning can help us pose the right kind of questions, change the questions, so that we can guide the user towards a good solution, practical solution, and also help us create uh, practical mechanisms. OK, all right, so that's good. Um, now, this is something that Professor Michael Karthi 
alluded to yesterday in his presentation, he showed these beautiful mechanisms uh, designed by Theo Jensen, by Amanda Cassie, and they're not ingenious, right? They're artists, apparently, and they design these beautiful mechanisms. Okay, well, we are asking well, how did they really do it? They tweaked the parameters and they finally got something that was working, and that's fantastic. Well, let's go back to a long time, right? Industrial Revolution. Games were designed this beautiful linkage system. You have a four bar here, you have a pentagraph mechanism, and it tries to get the water out of the mine, and later on became the basis for power generation, for machineries, for locomotion, and all that. Uh, but the basic question we still ask that France really apparently asked, and this is a quote from a book, I think, that Marco says, right, you know, uh, where he basically he questions as to, we have no idea how actually James Watt did this. Okay, and it is said that James Watt was more, more proud of his own mechanism than he was of the invention of the steam engine itself. That, that tells you something about the beauty of doing the kinematics, right? So, what are the questions here? Well, the first question is, how to decide what he had to do? Okay, well, this, that seems easy enough here. You have a power generation problem. I need a straight line mechanism, all right? Well, if you need a straight line mechanism, why do you need like 12 moving links to do that? And then if you have 12 moving links, then how do you decide where the pivots would be located? Where would the fixed pivot go, this fixed pivot go? What, where would the moving pivots go, what the link lengths would be, right? So there's a question that Sir Rowan raised. You know, what is the type? How do we choose the type here? How do you decide the, the degree of freedom? How do you decide the number of links? How do you decide the number of joints? The relative location of the joints, and so on. And I'm not even talking about the dimension. Right? So there's that question too. So, so then that's a big question. How do we design these things? You know, is it an art? Is it a science? So what we are trying to do is we are trying to answer this question. So the first and foremost is uh, we want to say that if you give me a motion generation problem, okay. You do not have to start by picking a type of a mechanism like the show here, because it does not work. If you give me a five, give me five position, maybe I'll be lucky, I'll get a four bar, but if I tweak one of the position, I won't get a four bar. Maybe I need a six bar. So that tells you that the information to compute the type, and compute is the, is the, the key word here, to, to calculate the type is actually embedded in the motion, in the given motion, in the top. So that's hidden somewhere, and we have to extract that information. And if you can do that, then we can calculate the dimension also. Okay, and this is what we call simultaneous uh, type dimension synthesis. This is a completely data-driven approach. Okay, and I, I'm not even talking about the machine learning right now here. So how can we compute the dimension and the and the uh, type together at the same time from the given problem? Okay, all right. So so I'll talk a little bit about that approach because it's important to see that we're not throwing away everything that we've done in kinematics. Right? Just because machine learning has come around doesn't mean that we have to throw away what we have done. In fact, that wouldn't work. If we don't leverage the knowledge and insight we have generated in kinematics, we will not be successful because machine learning has gazillion parameters and, and all kinds of variables that you have to choose, you have to pick. And certain things would work for your application, certain things would not work. And that's the only way you can really solve that problem is by actually working on your problem with the machine learning tools and see what works for you. Okay, so I'll present to you things that have worked for us for the kinematic synthesis and hopefully we can build upon that. Okay, so, so in this approach, um, of course we are using the body kinematics and the stuff like quaternion and dual quaternion that we are talking about. Uh, we are using quite a bit of computational shape analysis which is concerned with shape classification and recognition. So if I give you a shape, how do you compute what the type of the shape is and you can see here you know, a hyperboloid uh, of one sheet, and you see a hyperbolic paraboloid of that intersecting, and the significance of this figure, which I will explain later on, and of course the machine learning. So these are the three separate sort of fields that we're bringing together to 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 pose the right kind of questions and solve problems for us. Okay. Uh, so the basic idea, again, okay, without any machine learning, so that's why we have a minus ML, is that uh, we turn this kinematic synthesis problem into a geometry problem. Okay. So by using the concepts of quaternions, whether they're planar quaternion for planar displacement or dual quaternion for spatial displacement, we basically translate or map the displacements into <coughs> points in a higher dimensional predictor space. So the planar quaternions, which are described by four numbers or four dimensional hypercomplex number, they map into a point in a 3D predictor space. A dual quaternion, which is described by, by eight numbers, 
maps into a, what we call a dual projective three space. Okay. So when we do that, a sequence of displacements, which can be seen as a one parameter motion, basically becomes a sequence of points in the image space of displacement. Okay. Now the linkage system, the mechanisms, they basically have geometric constraints. So if you talk about just planar four bar, and this is explained very well in Professor McCarthy's books. If you don't understand what I'm about to say, you should find his book, Introduction to Theory Kinematics. If you look at the four bar, four bar has two dives, okay? It doesn't matter whether it's a slider crank or all revolute jointed four bar. Four bar can be split open into two dives. Each diode, when you write the constraint of the diode using the quaternion formulation, it maps into a algebraic manifold in this high energy predictive space. Now if you have two of those manifolds, then the problem becomes that if you compute the intersection of the two, then the given image point should lie on that intersection. So that's what you were seeing in this figure. So if you see these dots, those are actual image, split, image points in the image space, and your, your task is to compute these two surfaces such that the intersection would contain the image points. So we turn a, a kinematic synthesis problem into a pure geometry problem in a high dimensional projective space. Okay. So once we do that, once we do this fitting, we get a pair of surfaces. And again, I'm just talking about the four bar, but you can extend it for six bar and so on. These surfaces necessarily may not represent a mechanical diet. Okay, this is where these unified or simultaneous type of division this comes in. The trick to doing this simultaneous type of division synthesis is not to write individual algebraic equation or synthesis equation for each kind of four bar. If you do that, well, you're not doing this simultaneous synthesis. What you have to do is you have to find unified design equation that can potentially represent all kinds of diet constraints. It's almost like theory of everything. Right? People are looking, physicists are looking for theory of everything that can explain you know, what the origin of the gravity is at the same time, describe the molecular forces at quantum level, right? So we have to bring all these together, otherwise we cannot do some type of dimension synthesis. Once we do the fitting, that's our first step, once we do the fitting, and we do like general generalized surface fitting, we use feature extraction technique to find out which kind of diode is really represented by the problem. And that tells us whether we have an RR diode or an RP diode or a PR diode or a PP diode and so on. That's for the four body mode. Okay? And finally, we can assemble those constraints together to find the mechanism. All right? So I'm going to illustrate this problem um, very, very quickly in the context of something that everybody knows very well, which is the Bernstein problem. Right? It's a 100 plus year old problem, uh, which is described very simply that if you have five positions, it's a motion generation problem. Then give me a four bar linked system with all regular joints such that it can go through the five position. Right? And of course, there are a ton of ways you can do this stuff. You will synthesize the structural equations, you solve them, and of course, if you're lucky, you will find all of them on the same circuit, same branch, in the right order. But of course, that doesn't happen. We've seen that. Okay? So, what we sought to do was we said that, okay, this is pre machine learning work, right? How can we extend that problem? Right. So we are asking the question like, okay, we, we let's let's not just focus on the motion part, right? Let's say we have uh, the motion, we have the given poses, we know the, the, the uh, actual positions of the of the motion, but let's think of them as constraints for our problem. But they are not the only constraints. Our constraints can also be where the fixed pivots are, where the moving pivots are, things like that, right? And let's also not focus on just the four bar with the regular joint. Can you give me? Uh, can you give me any kind of four bar that can do that, right? Whether it has a revolution joint or prismatic joint. So I want to know the type and dimension both for any kind of geometry constraints. And I'm defining geometry constraint here as a constraint on a pose, as well as a constraint on the location of the pivots and things like that, right? So if you're trying to design portable machines, you can have your pivots lying on the ceiling or somewhere far apart, right? So those are real constraints. Just So these are as important as the constraints on the poses, on the motion. Right, so we're expanding the kinds of problems that we can pose now. Even these constraints don't have to be linear. Now, it turns out that in our formulation, the constraints on the pose, the location of the pose, is actually a linear constraint, but we can make them to be non linear constraint. They could be exact constraint, they could be approximate constraint. And that, these are all important things to sort of bring in because 
Um, if you just simply say, I have five positions, I want a four bar that goes through all of them, then you're not really giving any flexibility to the designer if, if, let's say, he or she doesn't get a good solution, right? If you don't get a good solution, then where do you go? You need to guide the designer to do something in that case, okay? So those are the kinds of things that you know, we want to solve. So here are some example problems, right? Here are the five positions. There's no four bar for that. Not any kind of four bar. Not just revolute joint at once, right? Here is a problem where you have four positions and I'm giving you two locations for the fixed pivots. <laughs> and I'm saying, give me a four bar where the fixed pivots are on those two points. Well, you already know that this is not, this is an over-constrained problem, right? Because it's a, if your four positions is a single infinity uh, solution, then you can only impose one more constraint. Now I'm giving you two constraints over here. This is a problem where I'm trying to design a, a landing gear for, uh, for an aircraft and you know, I, I have a constraint on the space, so I can only have my fixed pivots in this region and so on. Uh, that's for a seat inside a car, and I want my fixed pivots to be along a circle, right? So that's an example for sort of a non-linear constraint over here. So, so what we need is a unified equation that can represent all of these constraints, whether they're constraints on the RP diode, on PR diode, or RR diode, doesn't matter, okay? Same thing for the location of the pivots. Can we have a unified representation for all kinds of uh, geometry constraints? Yeah. Okay, and then see if, let's say, we can find a solution using our structural equation. Then can we relax some of those constraints? So, so that's where the optimal control comes in. Okay, so this is something that Professor Gur in the morning talked you know, rather very quickly about. So I'm not going to spend too much time except to say that here are the. This is just, just focusing on the planar four bar because it's sort of easy to understand and visualize. And, and also, the practical reason that Mr. McCarthy has a blog on his website where he actually did some research on how many patents were filed for four bar from what, 1975 or something until now? And he found like 96% of the patents were actually for four bar. And only about 3% for six bar and many were. We don't know for what, right? So, four bar is still important. Uh, so each of these diets actually poses a geometry constraint. Like for an RR, you have a point that lies on a circuit. For a PR, there's a, there's a point that remains on a fixed line. For an RP diode, there's a line that's tangent to a circle. And for a PP, there's a line that maintains its orientation with this picture on the line, right? So each of these geometry constraints can be written very easily. So basically, this is an equation of a circle. So we're using homogeneous coordinate. This is what we write, okay? When you make A0 to be 0, it degenerates into a line, right? So Looks like if you write this equation of a circle, you also get the equation of a line if you make one of those parameters to be zero. So you can say this is a unified equation for circle and line, right? Now, you get something similar for an RP diode also, except that you have to change the role of L and X, okay? But because you have projective dualities, so it's the same equation that works for you. So we use quaternions, and Professor Gert talked about this, so I won't spend too much time except to say that using linear quaternions, we take a planar displacement and turn that into a four-dimensional hypercomplex number, which we call planar quaternion. Right? Uh, we have our usual transformation in plane, and we can encode them using quaternions as long as we substitute for cosine and sine phi from here. So you have to find the inverse function for cosine and sine phi in terms of z1, z2, z3, z4, and you'll get your transformation matrix in terms of planar quaternions. So you do that, and these are the two. Uh, matrices. This is the transformation matrix for point transformation. This one is for the line transformation. And H part is basically nothing but transpose of inverse of this. So you take this and you substitute in these two equations, which are the equations of circle and line only. Nothing fancy going on here. And you get basically this. Okay? You get this. So now over here, all these coefficients from P1 to P8 are functions of your diode parameters, right? Where the fixed pivots are, what its length is, and so on. <coughs> What does this look like? In the image space, the four-dimensional image space, uh, this is basically a manifold of degree two. It's a quadrant. It's a degree two surface, right? That's what it is. And that's the surface that I was showing you before. So this one equation over here is one surface that can represent an RR diode, can represent an RP diode, can represent a PR diode or a PP diode. This is your unified design equation for the geometry constraint of every diode. Okay. Now, if you make certain parameters to be zero, you'll find one of the specific kinds of time. Okay. So what do we get? Well, this is our uh, unified equation. 
we have eight homogeneous coordinates here because it's a homogeneous equation. And each of these P1 to P8 are a function of the diagonal path, which is right. So A0, these are X and Y are the, the coordinates of the moving pivot with respect to the moving frame. But of course, we know that we have only five independent parameters, so there's some redundancy here. And we find the two algebraic equation, or quadratic equation in this case, uh, that relate these objects. Okay, so these are the two fundamental quadratic equations. So what this is saying is that if you give me any arbitrary surface like this, sorry about that, uh, like this, this is a general surface, but it is not mapping to any particular kind of diet unless you impose these two conditions. So these two conditions along with that will define a mechanical <coughs> diet for you. Okay. So this is basically a geometric constraint which can be written if you know the pose information. So if I give you a one pose, well, I know that corresponding to that post my plane of coordinates because I know my displacement angle as well as the uh, location of the moving frame. I substitute for those plane of quaternions and I get one linear equation from NP1 to P8. Right? I get one linear, so this becomes a linear equation. So it's a linear constraint on one post. If I am given five positions, then I have five such equations. Great. All right. Now let's look at the other types of constraints. So if I give you a constraint on the location of the fixed pivot, Location of the fixed pivot, and let's say I'm saying that I, I can have my fixed pivot line on any conic section, okay? Then I already know what my fixed coordinates look like with, in terms of my piece, so I can substitute that here, and I get something like this. So this is a non-linear geometry constraint on the location of the fixed pivot. If I make ABC to be zero, then this this degenerates into a line. So this is saying that at my fixed pivot that I want to be on a line, so I've got this. If I specifically want my pivots to be at a certain point, then I can make all four of these zero, or A, B, C, E to be zero, and I get again linear equation, but they specifically give you where the pivots are located. So where am I going with this? Well, I'm assembling my constraints, right? All of these constraints. So, so far, I've got my post constraint, I've got my linear constraints on the fixed pivot, but I can also do it on the moving pivots. That's not a problem either. This is exact location of the fixed pivot, exact location of the moving pivot. If you look at all of these, these are all linear equations. So you can just write them like that. Sigma A i, A j, J or sigma A i, P i, zero. So if we want to solve all those constraints, right, how do we solve them? Well, we have, if let's say we have n constraints, so five positions, two constraints on the pivots, one constraint on the moving pivot, and so on, then essentially I will have n such constraint and n such equation. And we have eight coefficients to solve for. So if you write this as a linear system of equation, we basically have a matrix A, the coefficient matrix, which is size uh, n by eight, right? So of course, this is an over constraint system of problem because you have only eight parameters. So how do we solve it? Well, we use singular vanity composition that works very well. And in this case, because the right hand side is zero, we know that solution is another space of A, right? So if you have five positions, we know the rank of this matrix will be five, the non-space dimension will be three. In that case, you have to pick three right singular vectors that correspond to smallest singular values, and you get basically a candidate solution. You get a candidate solution. In this case, I'm writing eight n minus n. When n is five, then you would have only three, right? So v1, v2, v3 are the three singular vector solutions. We form a linear combination of those, and that's the candidate solution for our problem. But that's not sufficient, right? Because we have to, we also have to impose the quadratic conditions on that, right? So this is the candidate solution vector. If you take this P and you substitute into your uh, unified linear form for the constraint, well, you get everything in terms of alphas, right? Because now the alphas are the new coefficients that we have to solve for. If we find the alpha, V1 and V2 and so on are known, so we will be able to get my P, okay? If you have a nonlinear constraint, you will again substitute this P in here, and you'll get a nonlinear equation in this case. So now everything has been transformed into finding the solution in the alpha space, all right? And then we have the two quadratic conditions. You do the exact same thing, and we get another two linear, uh, two nonlinear equations in terms of alpha. And now we can solve for all things. So, so if we have exact number of equations as as an unknown, like for five position problem. You can solve them, right? But if you don't have that, or if you want to relax certain constraints, then you have to create an optimization problem. So the optimization problem could be that, okay, I have uh, certain constraints that I can relax. Right? So let's say F1 and F2 and so on, and I can have some weights also associated with that. 
then I have to minimize that. So example would be I have five position, but you know I'm not getting a good solution for five positions, so I can relax my third position. So for the third position, I will have now an objective function that I can constrain. Okay, but I want it to be as close as possible, not be like arbitrarily located. And then you have some constraints on top of that, right? So there could be quality constraints or or some other fixed constraints. So things you can relax, but things you can't relax. So things you can relax go in here. Things you can't relax should go in here. Right, so now you've got this whole system where the designer can pick which ones are important to him or her and which ones are not and which ones he or she can relax, okay? All right, so this is representing some sort of algebraic fitting error for the constraints that you can relax. After that, the solution part is easy, so I won't spend too much time on this because you all know how to solve the Lagrangian multiplier method. Uh, so we use the Lagrangian multiplier method to basically solve this problem, do all kinds of partial differentiation. Since we have inequalities, so we also have to bring you know, some more uh, optimization stuff in here to make sure that we're getting feasible and, and practical solutions. Okay. But in the end, once you've solved everything, you get your P. Right? That's, what, that's what you get. Once you get your P, that P is basically a vector that represents the manifold in the higher dimensional space. Well, we have to know which kind of diet it is, right? At this point, you can examine the signation, and that will tell you what kind of diet it is. So if none of the coefficients are zero, we know it's an RR diet. If P would be four, P5 are zero, it's an RP diet. If P would be two, P3 is zero, then that's an RPR diet. So this is the type synthesis part. So we're not assuming any type. We have unified design equations, and we can actually compute the type from this, right? And we are extending this to now six part and spherical and spatial uh, platforms as well. And this, you remember, so it's just written for, for uh, I should, you know, making you remember that we have these relationships, right? So if you're wondering as to how this is, well, you have to know that for, for an RP diet, the A's, uh, for a PR diet, A0 would be zero. So if that's the case, then P1 would be zero, P2 would be zero, and P3 would be zero. That's how you get the PR diet, right? Okay, so let me sh show you a couple of examples before I talk about the machine learning part. Um, this, is the qu this is the problem where there's no solution. This is the Burmester problem. I have five uh, positions. There's no four bar, either with the Willard or prismatic joint. So what do I do in this case? Well, the designer needed this. So let's say we can relax one of the positions, and in this case, we can relax the third position. So you want your four bar linkage to go to the first, second, fourth, and fifth position, but the third one should be as close as possible. So that's my uh, F1 that goes into the uh, objective function. These are the two quadratic constraints that have to be exactly satisfied. So we bring that in and then we solve for it. And it turns out we can now find two diets. And you can see over here how one, two, four, and five are on, the, on, the, on one of the circuits. Actually, I can see one, two, no, one of them is on the other circuit. So we still have a circuit defect here, but the third one is slightly away, right? Okay. All right, um, this is the landing gear problem. So in this case, what we will do is we'll progressively relax the constraint. We'll see what we can do with all the five positions. If we can do that, then we can relax from the poses, and then we can incorporate the additional pivots also. So uh, let's say five position synthesis. So for five position synthesis, this is what we get. One of the diets is too large now. It's not going to work for us. Okay, so let's see if we can relax one of them and see something better. Okay, we got something better. We relaxed one of the positions. The diets are much, more, uh, much better behaved. Um, but it's still one of the fixed pivotals outside. Now we can say, okay, can we have the fixed pivots on the circuit? So we bring that constraint also. Now we can solve and we can find that we get a pretty good solution in this case. That's another uh, solution we get here. Okay. Now we want it inside. Oh, in this case, actually we find an RP diet also. So not just all RRRR, we find an RP diet with an RR diet. So it looks like you know we, we are getting something by relaxing some of these constraints, right? So that's good. But it is still doesn't solve the problems that I posed in the beginning, right? The problem of the circuit defect, the problem of the branch defect. So on the solution side, we have defect problem. But now it is one more thing. What we are asking is if we can create a multitude of solution. With the previous approach that I just showed to you, one of the big problems is that we're solving a quantity equation. So at a time, we can only get like four direct solution, which if you pick two at a time, you get six mechanisms. But maybe that's not sufficient for us. 
we want to be able to generate a large number of conceptual design solutions, right? That's, that's important. If you are trying to create some new mechanism that you can file a patent for, right? What Mr. McCarthy talked about, the inventive stage of machine design process, <coughs> we have to be able to let the designer exercise his or her creativity, be able to generate lots of solutions. On the input side, if let's say the designer gives you a problem, but you find there is no good solution, you need to guide the designer so that he or she can tweak his input, but in an intelligent way. So what we propose more recently is of the idea of an AI assistant, which will sit between the user and the traditional solvers, right? So notice, we're not throwing away what we've just done. The so things that we've just done, we can still use those, okay? On the input side, we want the designer to be able to provide the input sort of in a high level, right? Not like, give me five positions exactly, right? Let's move away from how we've been doing things now and see is there a better way for the designer to specify the input. Once the designer gives you the input, you want to see if you can recognize that input in some way. And that's exactly what, what uh, you know, Professor Chakravarti was showing you when he asked you to draw a shape and it would, could tell you whether it belongs to a four bar or not, right? And that kind of stuff is very powerful because if you think about it, uh, if I can have some predetermination on what kind of linking system can potentially do this path, then maybe I don't have to search everywhere, right? So that's the recognition. If you find the input is really off the mark, can be done, you want to be able to impute it, which is intelligent modification to the input and you can tell the user, you can change this in this way and you'll get a good solution. Even potentially do the types of this also, because it looks like, you know, maybe we can do this for four bar and six bar, but when we get to the spatial robots, like what Professor Graval is trying to do, type synthesis using even dual quaternions may be very difficult. I mean, talk Professor McCarthy, he, he solves these polynomial equations that are like millions and billions in order, right? And he uses homotopy and supertopy to solve those. Maybe machine learning will have that solution for us if we can properly set up the problem, right? And then maybe use the solutions our synthesis solvers in conjunction with those to uh, get the concepts, do some sort of clustering, so the user has some way to figure out uh, which solution he or she should choose. Right? So this is a very high level overview of you know, what we're doing. Remember how I said that when you have five position, maybe the solution is lurking in the vicinity of another position? Well, that's what we're using. We are saying that we'll use the inference model. We will see if in the vicinity there is a good solution, and if there is, then maybe we can find it. So, variation synthesis mechanism is the idea that if you give me an input and there's no good solution for that, I can find if there is a good solution in that input problem. Okay? And that's where variation auto input is coming. So, let me explain to you this very quickly as to what's going on here. So, if you give me a raw user input, and let's say these are just a bunch of dots that potentially represent a path that you, are, that you want your mechanism to go through, the top, a particular couple of point, then a recognition model should be able to recognize what kind of input it is, and if it's a good input or not. So the, assuming that the network has been already trained to know what are the good paths that can be done by a four bar or a six bar, that it can provide some feedback to the user, okay? Generative model will allow you to pick something in the, in the vicinity. And this is, this is more like a high dimensional sort of a space uh, which, which is sort of, which is capturing the salient features of the input. Okay. Then you get, the, the model actually gives you a lot of preconditioned inputs and these are all good inputs. And all of these can be done by four bar. So if these all can be done by a four bar because the model has been trained that way, then we can potentially use our conventional solvers on those rather than on the given input to get the solution. <coughs> Once you have the solution, you may be able to find different kinds of solutions with the four bar, the slider prime, the invert slider prime, and you should be able to cluster them, okay? And this is where different uh, artificial neural networks come in, all right? If, let's say, you don't have computational solvers, then you can take a sort of a shortcut. We can also train network using something called a conditional BAE, conditional order encoder, to actually directly be able to solve for linking system without going through all these steps. Okay. So, <coughs> conditional order encoder that uh, Professor Chakravarti briefly talked about is basically two networks, two artificial neural networks that are combined together. All right. So you start with your input, and for let's say path transition problem, your input would be a series of points, 
on a given path, okay? Then you have certain hidden layers. So these are not convolutional layers. These are fully connected layers because we're not dealing with the image problem. For the image problem, CNNs work well. For this kind of problem, fully connected layers work better. And then we have, right in the middle, bottleneck. So this layer is the bottleneck. Now, what this does is it sort of forces your model to learn what is important about your input data. This is where you want to learn the probabilistic distribution of your input. If you don't have this, then you will not be able to do generative modeling. Okay? Now, the other thing about variational autoencoder, which is different from a regular autoencoder, is that regular autoencoder is basically just a compression-decompression scheme. Pretty much like MP3 <coughs> music uh, files. You compress them, right? And then you have a decoder. That decoder will decode it for you. So it's a, sort of a data reduction. You, you decrease the size of the file. That's what you do for more wave to MP3. So if you don't have variational order encoder, it'll be just compression decompression. That won't be very useful for us because, well, what good is it is that we have a given coupler path and we can just generate the same coupler path of the output, right? Now, what this does is it introduces a probability density function for the bottleneck layer. And that allows you to actually create new paths that can be done by Lincoln system, okay? The decoder, which is also known as a generative model, basically picks a sample from the bottleneck, also known as a Z space or feature space, and it, re it basically recreates your input. So you go from the input side, you train your network, and then you get over here, but you don't like your input because it can't be done by a four bar or six bar. You can actually interactively pick a point in the vicinity and get what it is, which you can feed to the competition solver. So, um, in fact, uh, uh, this stuff uh, will be presented uh, by uh, Srinath in one of the papers. So we have a couple of papers on machine learning in this conference. So if you're interested, you should take a look at that. So this is a, you know, quite a bit of math, and I won't go into the details except to say that the uh, basic idea is that we believe that there is the observed data, which is the x, okay, can be generated by a function. Right? And that function is dependent on the latent variable z and the parameters of the network. Okay, that's the assumption over here. And we are looking to sort of uh, find the probability of the z, which is the bottleneck layer, given the x. So x are the couple of points. Uh, okay. That itself is computed using this, but this can be computed directly because probability of x, which is the which is the probability distribution of your linkage uh, path points, is intractable computationally. You cannot do that. So you try to basically approximate that using a Gaussian distribution, okay? So the moment you say, I'm going to predict it using a Gaussian distribution, then there's an approximation problem, like what the Prost was talking about. So we have to sort of minimize that, right, in some sense. So our training loss for the variational order encoder then becomes a function of two things. One is the reconstruction loss. So if I put an input, you want to make sure that you can get the same output, okay? You should be able to get otherwise it has not been trained well. Uh, and the other is the divergence. So think of divergence as a regularization term that we just talked about. So you don't want overfitting to happen. Right? You don't want a situation where you have all this input data, the coupler path data, let's say, but it doesn't have to be coupler path, it can be coupler motion, it could be the entire linkage parameters. And your bottleneck layer basically nicely segregates everything out. If it segregates everything out, then the divergence loss is very low. It's very low, but then you know um, your reconstruction would be poor, right? So these two terms actually fight with each other. You can, if you try to lower one, the other one goes up. So it's a sort of a fine balancing game that you have to play. You want to make sure that your reconstruction loss is low, but it doesn't uh, increase the divergence loss as a result. And these are some of the expressions. So you can clearly see this x hat minus x is your reconstruction loss, and over here. This is what is known as scale. It's called scale divergence, uh, Kullback, Libre divergence, which basically computes the difference between the probability of the z, which is the bottleneck layer, and the probability of z given x. Okay. The reason it's called divergence is it's not a metric, even though it's a positive function. It's not a metric because it's not symmetric. Because the probability of a given b is not the same as the probability of b given a, and it also doesn't satisfy the triangular inequality. So it is not a metric. That's why they call it divergence to just to compute the difference between objects and this function. So here's an example of what we're doing. So let's say you input this, right? Once the network has been trained, then it goes to the recognition model, you get to the bottleneck layer. This is your two-dimensional latent feature space, right? This is where you have the mu and sigma. And you can see how 
this particular path may belong into one of these clouds, right? So this particular point may be somewhere here in the middle or slightly off center. But now, in the vicinity of that, in that cloud, you can pick another point and you will get another path. If you pick another point over here, you'll get another path. But these are all good paths that we know can be done by four bar. So if the path that the user inputted didn't really work, or the user specified it in the form of a sequence of discrete points, which may or may not look like path, then at least now the user has some idea as to what can be done with that. But it's not too far from what he or she inputted. Same thing over this one. So here we have uh, a path, and you can see all those points belong to all these collections of path, because this particular data point maps to somewhere else. So what you want to make sure is in your latent feature space, you have all these different distribution clouds, but there are not a lot of those. You want many, you want enough of those, and you want them to be sort of clustered together. If they're clustered together, you can do a lot of fun stuff with them. You can do interpolation between the two. So you'll be able to find paths that sort of interpolate between these two as well. Uh, so here you can see how the paths actually change in the latent feature space for 2D. Now this is all continuous variation of the paths that you can get for a four bar. So if you start from the top, you know, you can see in this direction, either the direction the paths change, but not drastically. And, and that's the sort of desired behavior over here. Um, this is a, a, a picture where we have the four bar, six bar, and slider crank linkages, and they're sort of their notions are mapped into the latent space. And you can see that there are lots of six bars and then lots of four bars, but four bars are sort of overlapping on top of the six bar because pretty much anything that can be done by a four bar can be done by a six bar also. Okay, not all of them, but many of those. Okay. Now, conditional BAE is a, is a variation on the BAE architecture that I talk about. And where this is helpful is when we want to do some supervised learning. Right, so that was an example of unsupervised learning because we had no label. We had just a path and we want to see what can be done, right? Now here we are saying that uh, we want to be able to design a mechanism for a given path. So I don't have a computational solver anymore, right? I don't have a computational solver, I'm taking that shortcut, end-to-end -end synthesis that, that we spoke about. So here we have X and now we have Y. So Y is a label and what is X? So X is no longer the path information or the motion information. X is actually the mechanism parameters. So here's this defense in six bar. And we have all these joints, all these joints are now described using polar coordinate system. So if you have six joints, you have uh, 12 such numbers, right? If you have three joints, you have you know, a total of six numbers. So, so once you have all these, over the whole crank rotation, you feed that into X. You flatten that, you feed that into X, and Y is your label, which is the path of So you're saying that here's my path, and I want my six bar mechanism, in this case you're specifying the type, six bar mechanism to do that path, right? So once you specify the label, it becomes a conditional BAE. The conditional BAE is called conditional BAE because you are saying I want to find the linked system conditioned to the path information, okay? But this doesn't have to be the path information if you think about it. You could have all those constraints I spoke about, the constraints on the fixed pivot, the moving pivots, they could be the condition. So you can incorporate pretty much any condition you want over here. Doesn't have to be even algebraically expressed like we needed to in our previous approach. So now it's the same thing. Basically, you do that. You do this. You have your uh, your latent space over here, and then you reconstruct it, and you basically get your linked system, right, for a given path. So uh, we have this paper uh, in the conference. So you know, can talk a little bit more about this. When we do this. So now. The, the same map that I you know, talked about before sort of repeats, the only difference is that now we are saying that the object data is generated not just by Z, but also now with a label, and theta G are the parameters, the parameters of the network, you know, the weights that Professor uh, generally talked about, as well as the, the bias. And recognition model proceeds in a similar way. You have X and Y, and then you have the parameters of the recognition model, and the conditional VA is going to basically model the distribution in the feature distribution. So, Okay, so here's the case where we have the raw user input. You know, this could be like a straight line, right? I mean, we all know how to design a straight line mechanism. So just a few points on a straight line, vertical straight line. In a conditional generative model, all right, what we are doing is we are saying that we, our label would be the motions. So what we want to do is we get the path, and now with those paths, we get the orientation. 
So the labels are the motion in this case. We want to get this because we want to use our solvers to solve this problem. Now, why is this important? Well, we know if I give you five points, right, and if I arbitrarily specify the orientation, I'm not going to get any four bar because the orientations don't match. In the four bar mechanism, if you look at the poses, the path information is inextricably tied to the orientation. So arbitrarily specifying the orientation is not going to work for you. So in this case, we can actually, given this input as a label, we can compute the orientations. Once we have the orientation, now we have the complete pose information. Now we can use the motion generation solver that I talked about in the first half of the presentation. And I get the mechanism. It does a type in dimensional synthesis. I can do all kinds of clustering. In this case, we use k-means clustering. And we find different kinds of mechanisms, four bar. And of course, this is just for the four bar, but you can extend this for uh, other kinds of mechanism too. All right, so uh, some of the architectures that we played with were the, for the four bar, just a path. Uh, for the motion, and then for slider crank and six bar, uh, and you can see the dimensions. You know all this stuff is actually in the paper, and then we did conditional VAE also. And for the conditional VAE, actually our latent space dimension increases. That's what I want you to see: ten and fifteen. So it's no longer possible to visualize them, right? When they're two and three, uh, it's okay. We can do this. When they're two and three, but once you get to that point, then we need some other ways to visualize them, right? Okay, so just a few examples before I wrap up. Um, this is an example where we had a conditional VAE network. I keep pressing the wrong button. Conditional VAE network uh, for linker system four bar. Okay, um, so this is the path that's given to us, right? And what we want to do is design different kind of four bar. We basically get the orientations, and then we use our motion solver to get all these different kinds of mechanisms that do the same path but not exactly. You know, we have like a sort of an eight kind of figure in there uh, to get this. So, uh, this is an example where we had this path and we wanted to medically design this defensive mechanism. Again, in this case, the label was a path, and we didn't want to use a motion solver. We wanted to yes, get the mechanisms directly, and you can see uh, quite a few mechanisms that sort of closely do the path that is you know, given to you. And again, you could generate a lot more, and I think that's where the strength of this approach is. You can generate a lot of different solutions. So, right? uh, this is another paper that we have in the conference uh, where we've been using machine learning in gate classification prediction and mechanism design. Uh, but again, it's just an application of what I showed you before. You have a path, and you want to design different four bar linked systems that can do that path, with, and you get very valuable solutions. Okay, uh, how am I doing on time? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay, all right. So I'm going to wrap up very quickly. So let me show you a, a neat example of something that I was fortunate enough to be involved in. Yesterday, somebody in the audience asked, uh, uh, Grewal, you know, how can we make these uh, devices available for the people and so on. So, you know, I had a friend a long time ago, he unfortunately passed away last year when we were at the Quebec uh, IDTC. Uh, he needed assistance uh, in getting up because he had post polio syndrome. And he asked me if I could design something for him. So, you know, we, we toiled multiple years before we designed something that could potentially work for him. But then, you know, his condition was deteriorating very rapidly. So he never got to actually use this. But in the end, the device uh, was constructed. We had some funding to prototype it. Um, the idea was that you want to lift somebody from a seated position. So, you know, physical therapists had already done a ton of research on sit to stand motion. It's very well known. Professor Royal actually has a patent on something like this with the, what passive gravity assist device, and I've seen his paper also. Um, but this is not passive, this is active, it's driven by an actuator. So, we designed basically a, a, initially a four bar link system, then we added a couple of links to it to turn it into a six bar because we wanted to get a sort of a, a thermonuclear translation along these joint paths. So the idea was to design a link system that would trace the, the, the joint trajectories. It was a very, very simple idea, nothing fancy going on here. Not the kind of work that Professor Grewal does with his exoskeletons. Uh, so we built a prototype, and then uh, in the end, uh, this sort of prototype we put together. Let me show you what this mechanism moves like. Uh, this is, again, using the motion gen. So you can see the path is tracing. Uh, we filed a patent for it, the school got very interested, and they licensed it to a company. The company is, has now brought this to market, so 
you know, it's apparently helping people who have any kind of you know, muscular disability or disease, including cerebral palsy and multiple sclerosis and so on. Uh, but you know, they, they're not really setting it for the home uses, they're setting it for institutional settings. So, okay. Um, there is a video, that, you know, I'll just play that. It's a bit of fun. Maybe I should have played this, that was a bit of self promotion if I play this. Uh, but this is from Virus Medical System, the company that licensed it. They, they basically created this video on the origin story. I'll just play that. Oh, can't see it. Nobody is coming here. Because they want me to make a fool of myself, huh? You were about to tell you. Yes? Just about. When? Just seconds before you acknowledged it. <laughs> <laughs> seconds after you oh, acknowledged it. Oh, Jim is here. Uh, 